Okay, so I, as you probably guessed, today's lecture is all about communications. And I asked you a question to start with about why we need satellite communications, or why does a spacecraft need a communication system? Got a range of answers which all seem pretty reasonable. I guess if you're a World Cup fan, yes, it's, that's a priority. Um, to get the data back from the satellites, to be able to watch World Cup. Yep. Wait, regarding the World Cup, you mean is in the World Cup televised because all of our television systems run on satellites? Yes, so, so if you're receiving the World Cup via satellite television, that, that's um, part of a satellite communications link. So you are, are happily watching at your World Cup just because you, your satellite has communications. Communications, you need to send data to your satellite to be able to control it, and you need to be able to get data back down. So it's a critical thing. If you don't have any communications, then you're not going to be able to do anything with that satellite, so it's defunct. So again, as with power, a very important system, and we can see, see why. Okay, I'm just going to... A bit clunky. Okay, so we move on. Uh, so, as we've covered um, sections 1 to 10 already, uh, so we've covered all of, all of that, that part of the course, we're now moving on to communications. Then next week we will finish up the technical elements of the course covering attitude, determination and control. So that will be the final lecture sessions next week and then we'll go into revision. So what we want to, to look at this week or what, and hopefully what you'll get out of, out of it this week, um, are to be able to describe some of the key features of a communications architecture, so what, what we mean by communications architecture <coughs> and what those features are, um, and to be able to describe some of the key features of digital modulation. That's what we use when we digitize analog signals. So if we take a, a video, it's digitized, We're, we'll send that up to our satellite and we'll send that back down to wherever, whoever wants to see that video. Um, same with our data. If it's initially analog, we'll digitize it and then send it around, send it through the communication system. And then finally, we'll hope, hopefully you'll be able to use some basic analytical methods to work out what the communication link or the link budget. So this is looking at what the power requirements are to actually do a communication, what power gains you have and what power losses you have and what you have to overcome in order to make sure that you can communicate your signal is above the noise level, is distinguishable above the noise level, so you can actually get some communications. Okay, so the three topics that we will cover um, are the communication system architecture, the digital encoding methods, and then what we call the link budget. So hopefully we'll get through the architecture and some of the encoding methods and a bit of the link budget today and we'll give you an example um, or we'll give you an example on Thursday of the link budget so kind of going through and that's what the tutorial session on Friday will be all about as well. So some of you I think I've had some questions already about uh, Friday's tutorial so some of you are a bit, a bit ahead of the game with that. Okay so this is a diagram of a typical communications link. So you've got some sort of ground station here and you're trying to send data up to the satellite, and we call that uplink. And it might be at some sort of elevation angle. Why do you think the elevation angle might be important? Yep. The Earth is flat, and also we need to address the position, the position of the satellite. Okay, yeah, so, so we need to be kind of pointing at the satellite at another... Uh, refraction in the atmosphere. Yeah, okay, so if, if we have a lower elevation angle, we're going to go through more of the atmosphere, and that's going to have more interference and more effect on our, our communications link. That's going to give us a longer path through the atmosphere that's interacting with our signals. So that's quite, quite a critical element as well in terms of performance. Then we've got other things like free space interference, earth noise, and that's then the signal gets to the satellite. Free space is the fact that we're actually um, propagating this signal like so we've got an antenna that, that transmit this signal, and it's not transmitting all the power down one very, very fine beam. It's got some sort of beam width associated with it. So as it moves further away, that energy is spreading over a wider and wider area. Similar to the, the sun, the energy coming from the sun, as we get further away from the sun, it's being spread over a wider area. So the energy or the, the power per area is starting to, to get 
less and less as we get further away from that source. So our signal is going to get weaker and weaker as we get further away because that energy is being dissipated over a, over a greater area. And that's what we call free space loss. So the further away, the weaker the signal. And we've got then our downlink. And in our downlink, that's where we're, we're transmitting data from the satellite back, back to a ground station. And we might have interference, so local interference with noise that may be generated locally, or sky noise, so generated from um, galactic or, or solar system sources. Um, and all of those uh, act to, to reduce the quality of our signal. So we need to be able to overcome those. And finally, we might have some information flow between ground stations to send the data from one ground station to another. So you've got that full kind of link. Have we got any questions around that? That all looks sort of relatively straightforward. So that's, that's a basic structure of a communications link. Um, and as we looked, the primary focus of our, our uh, communication system, subsystem is to receive uh, operating, oops, operating commands from ground um, and also to send telemetry data back down to the, space, to the ground from the spacecraft. So we've got those two key operations that, that are really going on. For certain types of satellites, for certain types of spacecraft, the communications payload is the primary payload. It's the function of the satellite. It is to communicate. It might not have any other sensors or anything else on board, but it, it is, all it is doing is functionally communicating. And that's typical of a communication satellite, Iridium. So, uh, uh, mobile phone based uh, communica satellite communication system or the European um, navigation satellites, the GPS satellites for, for Europe, Galileo, or even the, the US or um, Russian versions, so GLONASS and the GPS network. All of these are basically sending signals to your phone um, and enough signals come into your phone and your phone knows be able to, is able to triangulate from those signals where it is on the surface of the Earth. And that's how a GPS satellite works. So it's basically a communications link between that satellite and your phone to be able to tell you where, where your phone is. And finally, um, the relay uh, satellite, so TDRS, Telecommunications and Data Relay Satellite. This is used for, for deep space missions to be able to relay data back to the Earth, okay, to kind of amplify the signal if, you're, if your signal is weak and you need, <coughs> you need more power. <coughs> so any questions around that? Yep. So do you think these could be good notes for the subject? Some satellites can only have communications on board with some of the GNSS and now have telecoms and relay satellites relaying data from deep space mission back to Earth. Yeah, so some, some satellites, their primary mission is communications, and that's what their payload is. Um, other satellites, maybe like Hubble or James Webb Telescope, they, they have some sort of sensor on board, like a a telescope, an imager, and it's, it's trying to gather data and then it's sending that data back to ground using the communication system. But the primary payload is, is the sensor, is considered the sensor. But on communication satellites, the primary payload is considered a communications link. It is their sensor. So different types of, um, we have different types of orbits that we can use to create communications links. So we can use what we call a store and forward. And this is for very low Earth orbit satellites. We might um, transmit some data to the satellite, some control data to tell the satellite to do something. Um, the satellite might do its maneuver or do its operation, maybe image the surface of the Earth, get some data, store that data until it comes over a ground station again and transmit that data back to the ground station. Okay, so that's a kind of what we, what we call store and forward. And it's very typical for low Earth orbit where you've not got a wide area that you're transmitting data over, so you've only got a point on the ground, a small point, and, and you're going to pass it every um, 90 minutes or so, so you, you've got options to, to do that quite re readily. We've got geostationary. So these are kind of s satellites that are stationary relative to a, a position on Earth. And then we can use links between the ground stations so we can, we can link the ground station communications together um, terrestrially to, to generate a network. And we've got 
Molnir, we looked at that before. So this is for um, communications links for um, polar regions where the geostationary really don't, don't cover so well. Um, but uh, you've got this, these satellites that have a long dwell time over those polar regions, uh, but you, you need to still have a network of those. So the satellite's not, not unlike the geostationary satellites, the satellite's not permanently kind of s stationed over that, that location. So you've got to have a couple of satellites and a crossover handover between those satellites. And then we've got um, some geostationary with crosslink. And this is advantageous because the satellites are talking to each other, so it reduces that, that kind of propagation delay between the ground stations having to talk to each other. So the satellites are talking to each other, which makes it a little bit faster, a little bit quicker. And then we have low altitude satellites with, with multiple crosslinks. So this is quite a robust network because you've got lots of crosslinks. So if you lose one satellite, it doesn't matter. You've still got other satellites that can still propagate that signal through, and it's quite robust. So those are the main types. So I'll go through some of the, the key advantages and disadvantages. But have we got any questions around those before I move on? No? OK. So the store and forward is advantageous because it's in low Earth orbit. So the cost to launch is relatively low. Um, the satellites are relatively low because they're closer to the surface of the Earth. The power required to transmit a signal it's quite, is reduced because you're closer to your target. Um, and so the satellite is smaller. That reduces the costs, the overall costs, and the overall system then just becomes a bit smaller and le lower cost. Uh, and small antenna power. So, so that means that's again a reduction in cost, a reduction in system mass. Some of the disadvantages are uh, potentially uh, long access times. So, so you might not be able to access the satellite, sorry, that should say short access times. Um, it's a disadvantage. You might not be able to access the satellite except for very short windows. Okay? So you, as, you're, as you're closer to the Earth, your satellite is passing overhead much faster, so your access times are much shorter. Um, you've probably got some sort of transmission delay. Okay? So you, you're um, sending a signal to the satellite at one ground station, and then you're picking it up later in the orbit. So, so, and sending that signal back down, or sending a um, return signal back down to the ground station. So there's some sort of delay in, in transmission as the satellite propagates around it, or moves around its orbit to go over the, gra the next ground station. Um, and also, because the satellite's moving quite fast overhead, we get what we call Doppler shift. So do we, have we heard of Doppler before? The way uh, the frequency of the sound changes as, it, as its source passes by an observer? Yep. So you probably all experienced it when, when an ambulance or, or some sort of vehicle with, with uh, noise sirens are going past. And as it's getting closer to you, it's changing its frequency. And you can hear it slightly differently as it goes further away. So you can kind of tell. And that's um, what's happening to radio signals as well. As it's going past, you get a little bit of shift. And so the ground station needs to be able to, to kind of account for that shift in frequency and track that. So it needs to have that capability built into it. So a basic ground station might not, might not do that. So you need to, need to have more capable ground stations. Any questions around that? <coughs> all, all fairly straightforward. OK. Uh, geostationary architecture, advantages, big advantage here is there's no switch between sat satellites. OK, so you've got these satellites located around. They transmit to the ground stations. The ground stations send that data around to the globe. <coughs> Excuse me. You don't need to track the satellite, so you don't need a ground station that has capability of moving its dish. Okay, so that's really good if you've got terrestrial stations, terrestrial uh, system. Um, sorry, <laughs> satellite-based uh, home systems. So you've got a, a dish on your house, okay, and you're watching uh, Sky TV. It's an excellent use of uh, geostationary satellites. So if you notice all of the satellite dishes for, for sky will always point um, <coughs> towards the horizon. So basically pointing south to, to where the geostationary satellites are located. Okay? They don't need to move. Okay? So you don't need to have a complex um, dish on your house that m tracks that satellite because it's always stationary. It's always in one location in, in the, um, in the view, field of view. The disadvantages are obviously geostationary is quite a high altitude, 
Okay? So the radius is 42,000, so we've got an altitude of 36,000 um, kilometers. So it's quite, quite high. We need a lot of energy, no launch vehicle to be able to get there. Um, this, uh, because it's further away, you need more power in your communications relay to be able to send the data. Uh, so this means you've got quite large satellites that you have to get quite into quite a high altitude orbit. So that increases the cost of the satellite. You also need a little bit of station keeping. Your, your, your satellite isn't going to actually fully maintain geostationary. You need to, you need to do some station keeping to keep it on orbit. So, so you'll need some propellant. So that will increase its cost and reduce the lifetime. And the big, big disadvantage is you, if you're in the poles, you don't have coverage. Okay, so so these, these geostationary satellite networks aren't, aren't useful for polar region coverage. So you wouldn't be able to get your satellite TV there. Okay, so Mo that's where we come to Molnia. Um, so the advantage is here, we do have polar coverage. And it's relatively low cost to launch because you're launching into um, a, a highly eccentric orbit, but your launch altitude is quite low to start with. And then you, you, you just um, increase the eccentricity of the orbit to get a higher altitude. Some of the disadvantages are obviously you need several satellites. Um, you need to be able to uh, point your antenna because the satellite is moving overhead, although it's moving quite slowly, it is moving overhead when, when you're, obviously when you're at the um, perigee, and that's not where you would probably be doing your communications, it's where, where it's at apogee, it's moving very slowly here, but it's moving quite fast here, so it's not very useful here. But where, it, where it's kind of passing overhead very slow, um, you'd still need to track your satellite a little bit to be able to reduce any um, issues with, with the movement. Um, there's a bit of switching between satellites, so it's quite complex. So you wouldn't, you wouldn't have this in a, in a domestic setting. This would be more for um, commercial or, or some military or other sites, types of communication. So it would be quite complex um, uh, equipment on the ground station to be able to handle that, that communications link. Um, and it also requires some sort of station keeping to keep you in that orbit. It will naturally keep in that orbit, so it's quite a stable orbit, the Molnir orbit, so it's chosen to be quite stable, but you'll still need to include a little bit of station keeping, particularly because you're going quite close to the surface of the Earth, so you're probably dipping into the lowest atmosphere, and you've got some drag acting on your satellite, so you're going to have effects related there. And then we've got our geostationary satellite with Crosslink. So as I mentioned before, the advantage of this is you don't have to link your satellites or your communication along the ground, so you don't have lots of ground stations, you're, um, that reduces your propagation delay. So, so sending signal from along the ground in traditional cables that we have on, on the surface is obviously going to produce quite a little bit of delay in the signal, but if you can send your signal directly from satellite to satellite and then send it down to the ground, that's a bit more advantageous. That also means you can send signals to mobile units as well, so you don't have to be a fixed ground station. Um, you don't need necessarily then a ground station in the territory um, that your satellite is passing overhead. You can, you can kind of handle, uh, handle that. Um, and it's uh, potentially a uh, reduced cost, okay? So, so um, you don't need as complex uh, ground station systems necessarily to handle. Um, the disadvantages for this are high cost relative to low Earth orbit systems. So, so that might um, preclude you from, from doing certain, certain things. Um, high satellite complexity, so the satellite might, cost might be quite high, although the ground station cost isn't. And then you still require some sort of station keeping. And again, because it's geo stationary, we don't have any polar region coverage. So if you, if you are doing operations in the pole or need communications in the polar regions, you, you can't use this sort of link. Um, and finally, the last, the last one is the low altitude multiple satellites for Crosslink. Okay, so the advantages here are because it's low altitude, again, it's low cost per satellite. We're closer to the ground, lower, ma lower power, lower mass. So the satellites, lower cost, lower cost for launch. Um, and you've got a high level of redundancy, as I mentioned before. So if you've got a lot of links, if you lose a satellite or a satellite's not communicating at some point, 
you've still got other links that can kind of pick up the signal and, and communicate around the network. So that gives you a high level of redundancy. I think it makes your system a bit more um, risk averse, more secure. And the advantages also is that you do have polar coverage. Some of the disadvantages then are it's potentially you've got some sort of complex link acquisition. So you've got to have the satellites be able to talk to each other and say who's linking what, where is, this, where is the data coming from and where is it going to. So there could be some complex networking that needs to be in place um, and complex control. And you need quite a lot of satellites. So you need, if you want a good coverage, you need, you need to have enough satellites to provide that coverage. So that could be quite, quite a few. Um, and then potentially if they're in very low Earth orbit or lower Earth orbit, you've got to have some sort of propulsion system to maintain them. Or you, you accept that they degrade over time and you replenish them. So there's, there's various kind of um, issues associated with that or formats of where you could design your, ne your network. All right, have we got any questions about any of those architectures or anything arising there? <coughs> Excuse me. No? Okay. Okay, so we'll move on to then how we actually communicate to our satellites through various things that we call frequency bands. So we divide up the radio frequency into, into different bands and we classify what can be communicated within these bands. Okay, so we, we need to identify um, certain bands for TV signals, for example, or for research or for um, broadband, for military classified, internet data, satellite crosslinks. We need to make sure we've ascribed different bands to them so that we're not causing interference, and so that if a new system comes on board, it knows what, sis what sort of frequency band it should be set up at and where it should be operating, so that it isn't able to, particularly for the military bands, it isn't able to kind of downlink classified data to try and do that. So, so there are sort of bands that the satellites can operate in and bands that satellites can't, particularly as well. Also, ground stations can receive certain bands and some ground stations can receive others. Because satellites are becoming quite prolific, there are quite a lot of them now, some bands are becoming a little bit overcrowded. So we need to look at, there's always a constant look, review of what these classifications and what these bands are to make sure that there's enough space for everybody to operate as freely as they can. Okay, so any, any questions around that? No? Okay, so I have a question back to you. Okay, so just think about this. Um, who do we think regulates satellite communications? Can we consider that satellite communications is global? Who's telling us who these bands are? What, what bodies might do that? Are there, are there global or national bodies? Any thoughts? See if I can. Let me put this up for a little while so you can have some ideas. Okay, so a couple of ideas already. See if I can get this up on the screen. Ooh. Okay, so a couple of ideas. Um, governments, NATO, UN, the Space King. Okay, that's a nice one. If we had a Space King. Um, the world's governments, yeah, international agreements, yeah. Uh, Dr. Hollingsworth, okay, I'm not quite sure if he, he has that control, but if you, if you want to ascribe him that control, fine. Uh, so all, so, all sorts of, of answers there, and all sort of um, quite relevant and quite correct in some ways. Uh, sorry, I should present this so it's a bit clearer. Okay, but predominantly what we have, and international agreements is a good, is a good guess, we have what we call the, if I go to the right hand Getting a bit of interference there. We have the international, 
Telecommunications uh, Union, which is a, an international body that countries, uh, um, telecommunications bodies can subscribe to or can become members of. And the te International Telecommunications Union define what these um, frequency bands are. They meet every four years and they identify what what's, might be the updates and what might be the reviews that are needed. And then the members, so someone to the FCC, that's the US version of Federation Communications. Um, I can't remember exactly what it stands for. In the UK, we've got Ofcom. So every country that is a member of the ITU, the International Telecommunications Union, will have a communications body or arm of the government that will be able to do that regulation. So they do the regulation, but the regulation on bands and frequencies and who's allowed to operate where is all passed through the ITU. So Ofcom or FCC need to... Need to uh, so if I'm a satellite operator, I talk to Ofcom in the UK, and I say, is it okay for me to operate by satellite in this frequency? And they look at whether, the, whether there are any um, conflicts or anything globally by sending that data to the ITU, and the ITU then put up a posting and people are allowed to respond to that and say, oh, but that's going to that's cause interference on my satellite, but that's going to happen there. But you have to be still operating within the right bands as well. So you'll only get a license to, elect, to operate your satellite um, if you're operating in the correct bands. So if your satellite is doing um, some sort of commercial work and you are operating in the amateur sa satellite band, you will not get a license. If you're a university and you want to operate a satellite and you're doing it without any commercial interest, then you can operate in the amateur band. But otherwise, you will need to operate in, in a commercial band. So there are all sorts of things, all sorts of regulations that you need to jump through. But the main thing is you talk to your local um, regulator, which is Ofcom in the UK, FCC in the US, um, various other ones around the world. And they help c communicate to the ITU, who sets all of these regulations. Any questions around that? So we're not, not going to delve into the regulations, but just to give you a flavor of what, it, what it's about. OK, so that's, that's the sort of legal side of things and the architecture. How do we actually send signals? So most of our signals that we send, as I mentioned before, are digital. OK, so we would rarely send an analog signal anymore. So we need to understand how we digitize our signal. So we take our signal, and we have a, maybe an analog signal with voltages, and we need to break that up into little packets. So we do that with what we call pulse code modulation. This is pulsing our signal um, to give a series of zeros and ones to create a digital version of our signal, a binary version. And it's this binary version that then when we transmit through our communications links, so we're sending digital, digitized signal. So if we are transmitting a voice, so through a telephone, the telephone takes your analog voice signal and it digitizes it and it then transmits that digital signal through the network and propagates that. If it's transmitting through a satellite network, it transmits that, that digitized signal. And then your receiver takes that, and it, um, you then hear that digitized version of that an initial analog signal. And when we're digitizing, we have um, sort of limitations. So a thing called a Nyquist theorem tells us how much we can digitize or how much the, the sort of sampling frequency needs to be to be able to receive that signal without any sort of losses or any sort of issues. And the sampling frequency, the Nyquist theorem states, has to be greater than two times the frequency of modulation. So if our voice frequency is several kilohertz, then the sampling frequency must be two times that. So for voice, frequency of modulation is around about 3.6 to 4.8 kilohertz. Yeah? Wait, so this is called Nyquist theorem, right? So this, this, the Nyquist theorem states how much we need to sample a signal, how, what the frequency we need to sample a signal at to be able to reproduce that signal faithfully. So that's okay. the Nyquist theorem. Effectively, yeah. 
And for TV, um, it's in the megahertz. Then, so we need to be able to sample much, much higher, at much higher frequencies. And we need to be able to sample at various levels. So this is where bit sampling bits. So, so the resolution is, is, is considered in bits. So if, if you have um, two 8-bit sample, that's 2 to the power of 8, that's 256 levels that you're, cr you're dividing your original analog signal into. So if you had 12-bit, um, how many, how many s levels would that be? 2 to the power of 12. He was quick off the draw with the calculator. <coughs> Can I get you quicker? 4096, yep. Yeah. Okay, so 16 so bit, even millions, okay? 16. So, so as you go up in higher bits, you're getting much better resolution of your signal. You're dividing your signal into much, much smaller elements so you can tell a difference between very tiny parts of your signal very much, much better. So you, you res resolve your signal much better. But obviously that comes at a cost of, in your transmission, you've got to transmit at a higher bit rate in order to be able to get all of that data that you, you're creating. So your data rate then is related to your sampling frequency and those number of bits, the n. So the higher your um, number of discrete layers, la levels, so the higher your n is, which dictates how many levels you've divided your signal into, the higher your sampling rate needs to be, your data rate needs to be. And that means you've got to have more power, more, more resources to, to be able to provide that. Does that sort of make sense? Or any questions around that? You know, it's a Monday morning and we're, <laughs> we're still getting our brains in gear, but are we happy with that? Yeah, okay, great, some nods. Okay, so the different schemes we have then to do this modulation, different ways we can do it, which are more and le or less robust and more or less susceptible to noise. So noise is a, is a real thing that we need to consider when we're looking at our signals. What the influence of other sources and that noise level is going to do to, to our signal. So we need to be very cognizant of that. So we can uh, do this modulation by changing the amplitude of the signal. So we can have, for our ones, we could have a high amplitude. So here's our carrier wave and it's, it's doing, it's taking our frequency and it's got a certain amplitude. And when we have zero, then we have no amplitude. So we're varying the amplitude of the signal to give us a packet of ones and zeros. Because so we're either switching it on or switching it to zero. And that changes the amplitude. We can have a thing called frequency shift keying. So the first one is called amplitude shift keying, ASK. Or we can have frequency shift keying. And this is where we change the frequency in order to create these packets of ones and zeros. So you can see here, we have a higher frequency signal, and then we have a lower, at one, we have a lower frequency at zero, another lower frequency, and a higher frequency. So we create this packet of one, zero, zero, one, this binary packet. It's digitizing our signal. Or we can have phase shift keying. So this is where we change the phase of our signal. So we're not changing the amplitude or the frequency, but we're just changing that phase when, um, when it starts effectively. And that gives us a, a variation, which we can then detect in our uh, receiver, and we can see which is a one and which is a zero, and pick that up. So we can reinterpret that. So any questions around that? We're all fairly happy, okay. So Shannon's law, which is an important law, it tells us about um, what the maximum attainable error-free transmission is for, for a given bandwidth. So when we're transmitting this data, we're transmitting in certain bandwidths, okay, so frequencies. And for a given bandwidth, Shannon's law is telling us what the kind of um, noise and the error likelihood is. So the maximum data rate we can get 
is related to the bandwidth and what we call the signal to noise ratio. So this is a very important parameter for our signal. Okay, we need to know how clear our signal is above any surrounding noise. And this then limits, if we've got a, a low signal to noise ratio, that's going to limit the maximum data rate that we can transmit at. So if we, if we can improve our signal to noise ratio, we can get much higher data rates. So that's an important thing, to be able to have higher signal to noise ratio. Um, it's also dependent, as we see, on our bandwidth. So we have to have a larger bandwidth, we're also able to get higher data rates. Okay, so, so those are, are um, mutually compatible. Any, any questions around that? Okay. Hope I'm not bamboozling you. You're all kind of happy with, with what we're saying. Okay, we'll go on. So this is where we come to the link budget. Okay, so the, link, the communication link budget is telling us um, what the gains, so increases in power, and what the losses are in our transmission link. So the losses are things that reduce the signal quality, the signal strength. Okay? And ha what the, we, when we do a link budget, we analyze what are all the gains, what are all the losses, and so what is the, the signal actually coming to our receiver. So we look, from our, we look all the way from our transmitter through that link to our receiver to understand what these gains and losses are. We calculate them all through and we see, are we able to transmit at the required data rate, if the customer has defined what the data rate it needs to be, um, or, and do we have enough robustness in that transmission link? So if there were other things starting, other sources of noise that we hadn't quite accounted for and they were, tr they were degrading our signal quality, is there some like robustness in that signal strength to be able to <coughs> accommodate for that. So we're looking at all of those gains and all of those losses, or as many of those gains as losses as we can quantify. So there may be things that we're, we're not able to quantify from the beginning, the things, sources of noise that we didn't take into account. Um, but as much as we can, what we can take into account. So gains, as I say, are increases of power. So we can get these by focusing our beams, so we can, we can take an antenna and, and we could broadcast all around our antenna that, that data. Okay, so we can transmit the, the data everywhere. That's called an omnidirectional antenna. Um, and that's probably what you have when you're listening to a, a radio station. You've got a, a radio antenna that, you can, that transmits data all around. Or we can put an antenna that focuses that energy into a small beam. And it takes all of that energy, all of that power, and it focuses it just into a small region so that we don't need necessarily as much power to transmit at the same level that we receive. We get a gain from our antenna. So our antenna is effectively increasing the power level and giving us an effective increase in power level, but it's only transmitting to a very small area. So we get one um, downside is we'll reduce the coverage but the other, the advantage of that is we don't need as much power to do that communication. So if we really need to target our communication at a specific location on Earth, that's great. But if we wanted to cover a wide area, then we would have to use low gain antenna. So. Um, and then losses. We've got to consider where all the sources of potential loss might be coming from. So this is, as I said before, we've got this what we call free space loss as, as our signal propagates out. Even if we've got a narrow beam antenna, it's still got some angle associated with it that gets, means that that area that it's covering gets larger and larger as you get further and further away from that antenna, which means that the signal strength at a particular point is going to get less and less because the power at that particular point is going to be lower. So the power over an area is... Um, because the area is getting bigger and bigger, that, that sort of power at that specific point gets less. Uh, we've got things like rain or clouds that might scatter our signal, so they interfere with our, the, um, the radio wave actually transmitting the signal, and they cause scattering, which reduces the power, reduces the effect um, to actually get to the ground station or get to the target. Um, and all of these things, are also, if we've got pointing errors or our satellite isn't quite on target, you've got losses there. You've got losses 
from um, ohmic losses if things are being, if you're a signal, if you're in your satellite, things are getting heated up, but you're not actually transmitting all of that electrical energy as this radio wave, you're actually, some of that energy, some of that power is, is going to heat things up, as we call line losses. So all of these things we need to take into account in our transmission and our, our signal. Any thoughts, any questions around that? No? Okay. Um, so in communications link analysis, we're dealing with big numbers, okay? So we need to be able to have a way to kind of rationalize some of these numbers. And so we use what we call decibels. So, so we use logarithmic logs. So you're all familiar with log, log laws? You've done that in maths last year, I think, did you? Or probably in, in high school or A-level maths, you might have done that. So, so we use um, logarithms and ratios as well. So power to the receiver over power to the transmitter. And we're in decibels. This is equal to 10 log 10 power receiver over power transmitter. That's a ratio, so it's unitless, but we've, we've and also converted it into decibels. Okay, so, so this, oops, sorry, go back. So this then helps us take what might be a big number and kind of rationalize it. Oops, sorry. We can also express power levels relative just to one watt, okay? So, so if we just want to look at what the power of the transmitter is in decibels, so we, of, we often use the format decibel watts just to, to illustrate that it is, it is not, um, it kind of, it is relative to one watt, it's not, well it's still unitless because it's watts power over watts, but it's, it's kind of relative to a watt. Okay, so we can still um, add and subtract these. So, so with the, we use the laws of logarithms so to be able to then add up all our gains and take away all of our losses to look at our signal. Okay, so, so do we know how we, when we have a division in logarithm, what, what does, how do we handle that? Yep? A division in logarithm, you mean the division inside the logarithm? Um, so it, yeah, if, if I was to, to separate out that So anything where we've got divisions, the word, where generally losses, we will sub subtract. Yeah. And with multiplication, um, so anything where we've got things that we're multiplying together, so a gain, our power is multiplied by gain, we can just add that in decibel. So when we move to the decibel format, we're, we're using simple arithmetic addition and subtraction. But what we're doing in the power world is we're actually multiplying and dividing. Okay, so, so that makes our numbers a little bit smaller, a little bit easier to manage, and it also makes it clearer. A loss is a negative, a gain is generally a positive. Okay. <coughs> Any questions around that? Yeah. So in, I've just used a notation here. That's power for the receiver and power for the transmitter. So what we've got in our communications link is we've got a receiver, or first of all, we've got a transmitter. The transmitter transmits the signal, and then we've got to have some sort of receiving station that, take, that receives that signal. For an uplink, the transmitter is the ground station, and the receiver is on board the satellite. For a downlink, where is the transmitter, do you think? For downlink, when we're sending satellites from the from when we're sending data from the satellite to the ground, where would our uh, transmitter be? Yep. Exactly. So our satellite is our transmitter, and our ground station becomes our receiver. So it depends on whether it's an uplink or a downlink, which we classify as transmitter or receiver. Um, but we will always have in that link some sort of transmitter, something that is putting out the data, putting out the, the signal, and something that is receiving it. Okay, any other questions? Are we kind of happy with that? Yeah? Okay. Okay, so noise, sources of noise, come from all sorts of things, and I did mention a few before. So I said that atmospheric emissions, so scattering from rain is, is a big source of noise. We have to consider all of these. 
Uh, some, we get some noise from planets, from um, sun, from other stars, so other galactic sources. These are all producing radio waves which will interfere and interact with our satellite signals and produce some, some level of noise. Okay? Or they're producing some sort of particles that might interact, so charged particles that may interact with the communication link and cause noise on board a satellite. So all of these things we have to start considering. Lightning, again it's um, electrical, so it might produce radio waves, it might produce also um, charged particles in the atmosphere that can, can interact with our, our signal and, and cause noise. And then on the ground, we might have cars, we might have all sorts of artificial sources of noise, um, artificial sources of electrical emission, electrical machinery that are producing noise. Um, when the SOAR satellite, which was, we did some communications with it from uh, Schuster Roof, okay, we, we noticed a lot of noise on the horizon around near the hospital. Okay, I don't know what's happening in the hospital, but it's producing a lot of electromagnetic noise. There's probably all sorts of instruments going off there. Um, that meant that when, when our satellite was looking in the direction of the hospital and trying to, um, we were trying to communicate with the satellite in the direction of the hospital, we had a big noise band and it was very difficult to actually receive the signal. When we moved away from that, so when the satellite was not kind of in that direction, not pointing, when our pointing direction was not where uh, the hospital was, the, the noise level reduced and we were able to get good, good signal to noise for our, for our signal. So you can see the local effects quite, can have, be quite dominating as well, particularly in a city. That's why Jodrell Bank, which is a radio telescope, is, is situated really far away from the city and you're not allowed to use mobile phones and all sorts of things around there because all of these cause interference from the, ra the, the, uh, the observations that are, they're trying to do of radio waves from distant stars and distant um, galaxies. So it's all, all of that really important when you're looking at communications. And also, things internally in the satellite might ca not cause noise. So you may have things that are producing a microwave um, or internal electronic noises, the microwave devices or other internal electronics that are producing noise and you have to then account for that. That's going to interfere with your satellite signal. Okay, so all, all of these things need to be accounted for. Um, so we characterize this by having some sort of equivalent, what we call noise temperature. And we use this to, to define what the level of noise electrical or other interference that is happening um, on board the satellite or happening in the ground station that causes noise to create this, this interference. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, are we happy with that? Okay to move on? Yeah? Okay. So um, the noise power for a particular bandwidth is given by the Boltzmann constant. Has anyone come across this before? Yep, okay. Wait, is it 1.3 times 10 to the power of 20, 23 joules per Kelvin? Um, yes, I mean, it could be clear. Yeah, I, yeah, I can't remember off the top of my head. Yeah, but I yeah. so, so we got the, the Boltzmann constant, which we can use, okay. I'm not good at remembering it, so we'll usually in an exam give you it as well. So, but you should be aware of what it is. Okay, and then we've got the, what we define as our noise temperature and our bandwidth. And if we look at the, if we can um, do some dimensional analysis and work out the units, this works out as watts. Okay, I'll leave that as a bit of a homework exercise for you, but if you work out the units for the Boltzmann constant, um, the temperature, you can see Kelvin disappears, and you've got joules times hertz, which works out as watts. Okay. We've also got the noise density power at the receiver, which is often um, just without the bandwidth given. So, so that's a uh, Stefan Boltzmann constant again, times the, the, what we call the, the noise temperature. So we define what the noise temperature is based on that noise. And that's basically essentially what gives us this noise power. So it's the power within that signal that is all just noise. And then we've got our signal. Okay, so we can see at least in this diagram, our signal is distinguishable above the noise. So the noise level isn't dominating our signal and we are still able to see our signal. 
but in certain circumstances, the noise may dominate. So we need to make sure, we need to understand the, the signal analysis to be able to know that. Um, and this, and I think we have, we'll run out of time now, but this is how, where we come to our signal to noise ratio. Okay, and we can look for various signal to noise ratios and see what that means for the actual signal. So I've plotted a few different signal to noise ratios. So you can see the red line is the actual, um, what we're actually receiving. The blue line is what we transmitted. So the red line is quite noisy in that, in that circumstance. The signal to noise ratio is quite low here, it's two. And we can hardly, with the red line, we could hardly determine what our signal are, actually is if we tried to pick that up. So what we want to do is increase the signal to noise ratio. So if I, if I double it, you can see we're still we're sort of able to pick up what the stat frequency might be, but it's still quite noisy. If I um, multiply it by 5, so a signal to noise ratio is 10 here, Oop. we can see it's starting to get better. So we're going up along this curve. Either an actual power ratio, we see our numbers get getting bigger and bigger, or we can do it in decibels. Our numbers are staying kind of, because it's log, it's staying relatively small. And then if we go to 20, our signal to noise ratio is 20 ratio, we can see our signal is pretty good. What we're receiving is very much similar to what we transmitted. So we can, we can distinguish that signal very well. And we could go even further, 40, but you see we don't get much advantage between 20 and 40. So that's a trade-off that you might need to make. And do you need more robustness? Are there other sources of noise you haven't considered in your signal? Okay, so I'm going to leave it at that because I think we're, we're out of time and we will cover what we call the link budget and do the analysis in the next session. Okay?